Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to our weekly worship service. My friends, we are working our way through the book of Colossians together. And our message series is called Living the Christ-Centered Life. And up to this point in the letter, the focus has been on God the Father. But with this passage today, Paul turns his focus to Jesus the Son. This is one of the most important passages about Christ in the whole New Testament. In fact, it is one of the high points in all the Bible talking about Christ. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 23 describe the person and work of Christ in the highest, most exalted terms imaginable. When we say the person of Christ, we are talking about who Christ is. And when we say the work of Christ, we are talking what Christ has done. We are going to look at the person of Christ this week in verses 15 to 18. And then next week, we will look at the work of Christ in verses 19 to 23. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 15 to 18. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him, and for him. Verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. My dear family, it has been said the best way to spot a counterfeit is to know the original. Whether it's counterfeit money or counterfeit painting, the best way to recognize what is false is to know what is true. It's the same way with any false teachings about Jesus Christ. When it comes to Christianity, most false teachers or most false teaching distorts either the person or the work of Christ. And so the best antidote to false teaching is to know the truth about who Christ is and what he has done. And that's what today's passage and next week's passage do. They provide us with a solid doctrinal grounding in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Having looked at verses 15 to 18, which focuses on the person of Christ. That means who Jesus is. My friends, this is so important because without a proper view of Christ, you will never learn to live life with Christ at the center. As Christian pastor and author John Stott puts it, nothing is more important for Christian discipleship than a fresh, clear, true vision of the authentic Jesus. In our verses this evening, Paul answers three questions about the person of Christ. Who is Jesus in relation to God? Who is Jesus in relation to creation? And who is Jesus in relation to the church? And here are the answers. Jesus in relation to God it simply states that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In relation to creation, Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. In relation to the church, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Now we are going to look at each of, of these three descriptions and what they mean. But right up front, let me tell you that together these verses teach us the supremacy of Christ. Christ is supreme over all things, which is why Christ is central to all things. 
which is why we are called to live the Christ-centered life. Now let us look at each of these three descriptions of Christ. First of all, Jesus, my first major point is this, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's what Colossians 1 verse 15 says. He is the image of the invisible God. My friends, the Bible tells us that God is spirit, which means that he is invisible. 1 Timothy 6.16 says that God lives in an unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. Have you ever seen God? No, you haven't. If you did, you wouldn't be here. You would be dead. But Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And when Jesus came, the invisible God became visible. Now, the word translated image in this word, or in this verse, is a word that means a copy, an exact representation. My friends, in New Testament times, it was used of images on a coin. We still use images on our coins today in some countries. Do you want to know what Abraham Lincoln looked like? Look at a penny. Do you want to know what God looks at or what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says this. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. In John 14, when Jesus was talking with his disciples about God, Philip asked him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered Philip and said this, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? This scripture is found in John 14, verse 8 to 9. My friends, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Remember the Ten Commandments. The second commandment forbids us from making any images of God. We are not to make any idols or representations of God. Why? Because Jesus is the image of God. We are created in God's image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 27. But Jesus actually is God's image. Now we read in John chapter 1 verse 18. Let me take scripture out. John chapter 1 verse 18. John chapter 1 verse 18. Scripture says, No one has ever seen God. But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. What is John saying here? That the God who is invisible became visible through Jesus Christ. So that's who Jesus is in relation to God. He is the image of the invisible God. The second major point is this. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. So we want to see who Jesus is in relation to creation. And here we learn that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Look at verses, uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17. He is the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. These are amazing words, staggering in their description of Christ in his relationship to creation. Remember, my friends, the false teachers at Colosse had a wrong view of creation. They thought that all matter was evil. 
whether the material world or the human body. But the Bible teaches that God's creation is good and that Jesus is the firstborn over all God's creation. Now, this phrase, firstborn over all creation, is an important phrase to understand correctly. Unfortunately, it has been wrongly used over the years to teach that Jesus is the first created being. For example, there was an early heresy in the church called Arianism. Arianism was the false teaching that taught that Jesus was created rather than eternal. The Jehovah's Witness today teach the same thing. Remember what we said earlier. Most false teachings have to do with a distortion of either the person or the work of Jesus Christ. The false teachings of Arianism and the Jehovah Witnesses are both a distortion of the person of Jesus. They give us a false understanding of who Jesus is. Now, in the Bible, the word firstborn does not necessarily mean the one who was born first. Rather, it means the one who has the right of inheritance. In fact, the firstborn was used as a title for the Messiah who would rule over and inherit God's kingdom. For example, God says this about the Messiah in Psalm 89 verse 27. Psalm 89 verse 27. This is what the scripture says. I will appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of kings of the earth. And so the phrase, the firstborn over creation, does not mean that Christ was the first created being. Rather, it means Christ's superiority over all creation, that he is the ruler and heir over all creation. Revelation chapter 3 verse 14 brings out this proper sense of the word firstborn when it called Jesus the ruler of God's creation. Revelation 3 verse 14. The ruler of God's creation. As the firstborn over all creation, Jesus is both ruler and heir. Now, John MacArthur notes this. John MacArthur notes that when firstborn is followed by a plural, as in Colossians 1.8 and in Romans 8.29, the firstborn is part of the class that follows. When it is followed by a singular, it means rank or superiority over the class. There is a, dif there is a different word that Paul could have used for first created, which is prototistos. Prototistus. But he didn't use that word. He used firstborn, prototokos, instead. My friends, when we compare scripture to scripture, it becomes clear that Jesus was not a created being. For example, we read in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. If all things were made through Jesus, and without him nothing was made that has been made, then he cannot be part of the all things that were made. He cannot be a created being himself. So who Jesus or who is Jesus in relation to creation. He is the firstborn or ruler over all creation. And in the next verses, Paul tells us four things that are true of Jesus as the firstborn over creation. Firstly, Jesus created all things. Secondly, Jesus inherits all things. Thirdly, Jesus existed before all things. And fourthly, Jesus sustains all things. First of all, Jesus created all things. Look at verse 16 again. For by him all things were created, things in the heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Once again, Jesus created all things 
that that therefore he is uncreated if he created all things then he cannot be a part of creation himself and when paul says jesus created all things he really means all things first of all he created all things in heaven and on earth this is a reflection of Genesis chapter 1 where we read in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1 1, 1. Genesis tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. Colossians tells us that Jesus created all things in heaven and on earth. Now the conclusion is unmistakable. Jesus is God and all things were created by him. And just as God did not save the world apart from Christ, so he did not create the world apart from Christ. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all involved in the great acts of creation and redemption. If you wanted to state it as precisely as possible, you should probably put it in this way. God the Father created the world through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God the Father saves us through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's come back to Colossians. Now when we come back to Colossians, now Paul continues in his description of the all things that Jesus created. The things in heaven and on earth that Jesus created are further described as visible and invisible. There is both a physical and a spiritual world that God created. We, not, we, we today only see the physical world. But the spiritual world is just as real. Where did the physical world come from? It came through Jesus. Where did the spiritual world come from? It also came through Jesus. So Paul describes this invisible spiritual world even further when he says, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. These terms refer to the various beings that inhabit the spiritual world. Early writers tried to rank the spiritual beings and figure out which ones were more powerful than others. For example, they put the thrones in what they call the seventh or highest level of heaven. However, the Bible never really ranked this thing or these beings. There's no ranks for us. There's no ranks in the heavenlies. The Bible never really ranks these beings for us. So Paul gives us a similar list in Ephesians 1 verse 21, but in a different order. So we cannot figure out rank from this list. But that's not my point anyways. The point is that Jesus created all these beings and therefore Jesus is supreme. He's the firstborn. He's the ruler. Remember my friends, Worship of angels was part of the false teaching at Colossae. And Paul corrects this by teaching that Jesus created all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. Therefore, we should worship Christ alone. My second major point is this. Jesus not only created all things, he also inherits all things. Jesus inherits all things. That's what we see at the end of verse 16. All things were created by him and for him. Remember, my friends, that's part of what the firstborn means. The firstborn was the one who had the rights of inheritance. Hebrews 1 verse 2 speaks about Jesus' rights of inheritance when it describes him as God's son whom he appointed heir of all things. Hebrews 1 verse 2. Romans 11 verse 36. Romans 11, 11 verse 36 says something similar about God. The word of God says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And so Jesus is not only there at the beginning of all things as creator. He's also there at the end of all things as the heir of creation. It's interesting. The rabbis thought that the world was created for Messiah, but they didn't know that the Messiah also created the world. 
Colossians teaches us that all things were created by Jesus. And all things were created for him. Jesus is the heir of creation. He not only created all things, he also inherits all things. And then there's the third major point that I want to make. The third thing Colossians tells us about Jesus as the firstborn over all creation is that Jesus existed before all things. Colossians 1.17 says he is before all things. We read the same thing in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. In the beginning, before anything had yet been created, Jesus was with God and he was God. In John chapter 8 verse 58, John chapter 8 verse 58, Jesus told the Jews, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. And, and this is a remarkable statement because that phrase I am was the divine name for God. And when the Jews heard him say this, they picked up stones to stone him. Because in claiming this name for himself, Jesus was claiming to be none other than the eternal God who always is and has always been and always will be. And Colossians 1.17 says, Jesus is. In John 8.58, Jesus says, I am. Now, I mentioned Arianism earlier. The church heresy which taught that Jesus was a created being. A man named Arius was the founder of this false teaching. And he summed up his whole teaching with his statement about Christ. There was once when he was not. And yet Colossians teaches us that Jesus is before all things. And therefore there was never a time when he was not. The Nicene, the Nicene Creed puts it this way, that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. God the Father is eternally the Father, and Jesus Christ is eternally the Son. There was never a time when God the Father was not the Father, because there was never a time when Jesus was not the Son. There was a time when I was not a father. I did not become a father until Shekinah came into existence. But, the, but God the Father has always been the father. Because Jesus has always been his son. Jesus never came into existence. Just like God the Father has always existed, so Jesus has always existed. He is eternal. Or as Colossians says, he is before all things. And fourthly, Jesus sustains all things. What do we mean when we say that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation? Firstly, Jesus created all things. Secondly, Jesus inherits all things. Thirdly, Jesus existed before all things. And finally, Jesus sustains all things. Now back to Colossians 1. Let's look at verse 17 again. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And so Jesus is not only the creator of the universe, he is also the sustainer of the universe. Or as Hebrews 1 verse 3 puts it, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus sustains all things. My friends, God did not wind things up at creation and then walk away. But he is intimately involved in all of creation. And here in Colossians, God providential, God's providential care of the universe is revealed as the sustaining power of Jesus. The firstborn over all creation. The galaxy spin at his command. Every star, every planet, every atom, every molecule at every moment is completely and totally 
dependent on Jesus Christ. If Christ should cease to sustain, the creation would cease to exist. Every breath you take in this world is dependent on the sustaining power of Jesus Christ. Christ is supreme over all creation in the past. He is supreme over all creation in the present and in the future. He is supreme over creation in the past because he is the creator of all things. He is supreme over creation in the present because he is the sustainer of all things. And he is supreme over creation in the future because he is the heir of all things. What do we mean when we say Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, over all creation? Jesus created all things. Jesus inherits all things. Jesus existed before all things. And Jesus sustains all things. You would be hard pressed to find a stronger statement of Christ's supremacy and his divinity. Once again, we are looking at the person of Christ this evening, my friends. And so far, we have seen who Jesus is in relation to God and in relation to creation. And now we come to our third point, who Jesus is in relation to the church. And here we find that he is the head of the body, which is the church. He is the head of the body, which is the church. Look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. The he at the beginning of verse 18 is empathic. No human being on earth is the head of the church. That distinction belongs to Jesus. Jesus alone is the head of the church. The church is the body of Christ and Jesus is the head of that body. That means there is a living relationship between Christ and the church even as there is a living relationship between the head of any body. As the body of Christ, we are united with Christ, who is our head. Paul goes on to define what he means when he says Christ is the head of the church. And he tells us two things in particular. Jesus is the beginning and he is the firstborn from among the dead. Now, first of all, Jesus is the beginning of the church. The word head refers to both source and authority. As the beginning of the church, Jesus is both the founder and ruler of the church. And Jesus affirmed this to Peter in the Gospel of Matthew. We read in, in Matthew 16, Matthew 16, verses 16 to 18, where scripture says, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. Verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus founded the church on the solid rock of Peter's confession of him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. As the head of the body, Jesus is the beginning of the church. And then, as the head of the body, Jesus is also the firstborn from among the dead. Now, back to Colossians 1 verse 18. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Now, the first thing we should grasp from this verse is the still amazing fact, after all these years, that Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. He served a risen Lord, or we serve a risen Lord who is alive forever. The resurrection of Christ is the basis of our life and faith. There is no church of faith without Christ's resurrection. That is the gospel. That is the good news we proclaim. Jesus is alive. However, the good news gets even better than that. Jesus not only rose from the dead, he is the firstborn from among the dead. And that means we will be raised from the dead too. 
Verse 15 told us that Christ is the firstborn of all creation. Now verse 18 tells us that he's the firstborn from among the dead. Once again, this does not necessarily mean that he's the first to be raised from the dead. Rather, just as in verse 15, it means supremacy. That Christ's resurrection is the basis for all other resurrections. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we will be raised too. And we find the same teaching expressed in, in a slightly different way in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 23. Where Christ is described as the first fruits rather than the firstborn. Let's look at scripture. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 23. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man. And the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die. So in Christ, all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. My friends, at Howard's time, the first fruits were an indication of what was yet to come. As the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, the resurrected Jesus was an indication that we too would be raised from the dead. The first born from among the dead carries a similar meaning to the first fruits. Because Jesus is the head of the body. And because Jesus rose from the dead, we are who part of the body of Christ will be raised from the dead too. And how can the head be raised and not the body as well? And then Colossians 1 18, Colossians 1 verse 18 ends with a summary of this whole section. It says, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Christ's resurrection from the dead completes the picture, my friends. He is the firstborn over all creation. And he is the firstborn from among the dead. He is the supreme, or he is supreme over all old creation. He is supreme over the new creation. Christ is supreme over all things. This is the only place in the whole New Testament that we find this word supreme. It is the word that means to be first or to hold first place. I like the way the New American Standard Bible translated. It says so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. My friends, Jesus is supreme over all things. And, and Jesus should always have first place. First place in the universe, first place in the church, first place in your heart. The false teachers at Colossae tried to move Jesus out of first place. But Christ is supreme. Christ is central. And he deserves first place in everything. In conclusion, my friends, I want to ask you these things. Why should you live the Christ-centered life? Why should you live the Christ center? Because Christ is supreme. Christ is at the center of all things. He is at the center of, how, of who God is. He is at the center of the universe. He is at the center of the church. He is central to all things because he is supreme over all things. Christ is supreme because God is supreme. And Christ is the image of the invisible God. Christ is supreme over all creation because he created all things and he, 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 he inherits all things. He existed before all things and he sustains all things. Christ is supreme over the church because he is the founder of the church and he's the firstborn from among the dead. What place does Jesus Christ have in your life? If Christ is supreme over all things, then he should be supreme in your life as well. Christ first should be your motto in all things. Christ is central. Christ is supreme. So this week I want to ask you, will you give Christ first place in your life? Will you give Christ first place in your life? Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts full of awe and reverence as we reflect on the profound truths revealed in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. In these verses, we encountered the majestic person and preeminence of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the glory and, and supremacy of Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Help us to grasp the magnitude of his deity, the eternal, his eternal existence, and his role in the creation and sustenance of all things. Father, we acknowledge that all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. We confess that you have absolute authority and dominion over every aspect of our lives. We surrender ourselves to your Lordship and we invite you to reign in our hearts and minds. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the reconciling work you accomplished on the cross. Through your blood, you made peace and brought us into a right relationship with God. Help us to fully comprehend the magnitude of this reconciliation and to live as ambassadors of your peace and grace. Father, we pray that you would increase our understanding of the supremacy and headship of Christ over the body of believers, the church. May he be the center of our worship, our fellowship, and our mission. Unite us all under the Lordship, that we may walk in unity and love. Lord, we ask for a deepening of our faith in you. Strengthen our trust in your sovereignty. Even in the midst of challenges and uncertainties, help us to rely on your wisdom and guidance, knowing that you hold all things together and that your purposes will prevail. Father, we pray for the church worldwide. May your spirit move in power, bringing revival and renewal. Raise up leaders who will faithfully proclaim the supremacy of Christ and equip believers for the work of ministry. May the church shine as a beacon of light in a world that desperately needs your truth and love. Lord, we thank you for the privilege. We thank you for the privilege of knowing and serving Jesus Christ. May our lives be a reflection of his glory and grace. Empower us to live in a manner worthy of him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in our knowledge of you. Finally, Father, we offer our worship and adoration to you. You alone are worthy of all honor, of all glory, and of all praise. May our lives magnify the name of Jesus Christ, exalting him as the preeminent one in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To our friends on social media, on Facebook and YouTube, we thank you for joining us. We will see you all next week. For those in our household, on Zoom, please hold on as we continue the next program in our worship service. God bless you all. Have a wonderful weekend.